Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today we're checking out Sapphire's new Nitro Plus Radeon RX 6800 XT and I am very keen to check this thing out given that the 5700 XT version was one of the best models we came across. And there are a number of changes here when compared to the previous 5700 and Vega series Nitro Plus models. So without wasting any more time, let's take a close look at the card, tear it down and then get into some benchmark results. Okay, so in terms of dimensions, this is quite a long graphics card measuring 310 millimeters long, and that means it stretches 17% longer than the AMD reference model. It also stands 134 millimeters tall, making it around 12% taller, and it's also 12% wider at 55 millimeters, so it will take up three expansion slots. So given that the Nitro Plus is physically quite a bit larger than the reference model, you'd probably expect it to weigh more as well, but it actually doesn't. Rather, this large graphics card only weighs in at 1230 grams, and that's quite surprising given its size. The reference card, for example, weighs in at 1510 grams, and that means the Sapphire version is 19% lighter, so that is quite surprising to discover. Now, Sapphire says that they're focused on refining the heat pipe and fin design of the RX 6800 XT Nitro Plus, and as a result, it is quite a bit lighter than past models. They gave the example of their Vega 64 Nitro Plus, which featured a 1580 gram heatsink. So that's not the total card weight, that was the weight of just the heatsink. And for comparison, the new heatsink on the 6800 XT Nitro Plus, that weighs in at just 775 grams. So basically half the weight. And this is made all the more impressive when you realize Vega 64 and the 6800 XT feature the same board power rating. That means they've been able to halve the weight of the cooler on a card that uses the same amount of power while also reducing the operating volume. At least that is what Sapphire is claiming. Design-wise, the 6800 XT Nitro Plus looks fairly similar to the 5700 XT version, though there are a few obvious changes. Firstly, the fans have been redesigned and look remarkably similar to the Axial Tech fans from ASUS. They feature a very similar ring design, though Sapphire has added some slots to the 100mm outer fans which rotate counterclockwise. Meanwhile, the centrally located 90mm fan spins in a clockwise direction. The fan shroud has been constructed using plastic, but it looks quite good and features the typical Nitro Plus Silver highlights. As for RGB lighting, most of the flashy stuff can be found on the outer edge. There's some backlit sapphire branding and a thin light bar. Then around on the back side of the card, we find a full length silver backplate with a backlit nitro logo. I have to say though, the backplate does look really nice and it even includes a few cutouts that help aid with airflow. Then finally, before we tear down the card, let's take a quick look at the I.O. panel. It's a pretty standard configuration, really. What we're looking at here is a single HDMI 2.1 port and three DisplayPort 1.4 outputs. Okay, so enough looking around the card, time to tear it down. After removing a series of screws from the back side of the card, the main cooler can now be removed. The primary heatsink with the three fans and plastic shroud weigh in at just 668 grams. That's incredibly light. It is designed to cool just the GPU though, while a second much smaller heatsink will capture airflow from the main heatsink to cool the VRM and GDDR6 components. And this is a very similar design to what we saw with the 5700 XT Nitro X model, and again it worked very well there, ensuring cool operating temperatures for all the critical components. But getting back to the primary heatsink for a moment. Here we find a small copper base plate which connects to half a dozen 6mm thick nickel plated copper heat pipes which disperse heat through three separate banks of aluminium fins. Now the smaller cooler, which is really just a series of smaller heat sinks connected to a heat spreader featuring two low profile heat pipes. Anyway, it's a neat bit of kit that directly cools the GDDR6 memory along with the power stages and inductors. Then over on the 260mm long PCB we find a robust VRM packing 16 power stages along with a pair of 8 pin PCIe power connectors and a dual BIOS switch. Now for the power stages, Sapphire is using Infineon's TDA2147-2 Optimos power stages which are rated for a 70 amp capacity, 13 of which have been used to deliver power to the GPU, 11 for the GFX, and 2 for the SoC. Then in addition to that, there's a single phase for the GPU power, VDDCI, and two phases for the GDDR6 memory. Finally, on the rear side of the PCB, we find just a single thermal pad, which has been used to remove built up heat from the back side of the VRM, or at least the VRM components located on the right side of the board. 
I had expected to find more thermal pads here, but obviously Sapphire has deemed that unnecessary. Still, it is good to see that some heat is being transferred to the aluminium backplate. Now, in terms of clock specifications, Sapphire lists a boost frequency of 2360 MHz, which is a 5% increase over the 2250 MHz default spec set by AMD. The GDDR6 memory, on the other hand, that has been left stock at 16 gigabits per second. When compared to other factory OC graphics cards, a 5% overclock is pretty mild, so it will be interesting to see how much OC headroom is left. Playing Shadow of the Tomb Raider for 30 minutes saw the Nitro Plus peak at 73 degrees in a 21 degree room inside the Corsair Obsidian 500D, fully populated with fans. And that's just 2 degrees cooler than the AMD reference card, though do keep in mind power consumption has increased by about 13% and the fan speed is also slightly reduced, so quite a good result really. Speaking of the fan speed, in order to maintain this temperature, the fan spun at just 1500 RPM, which is a very low fan speed. The typical core clock frequency seen during our testing was 2365 MHz, and that saw the power consumption for the graphics card hit 336 watts, so a 13% increase over the AMD reference model. Now, for overclocking, with the limits reached, we again saw a peak operating temperature of 73 degrees, but this time the fan spun up to 1700 RPM, though even here they were remarkably quiet and couldn't be heard over the case fans. The overclock saw the cores operate at an incredible 2560 MHz on average, and the memory also hit 17.2 gigabits per second, which is the current limit enforced by AMD. Finally, when overclocked, the card sucked down 364 watts, so an 8% increase from the stock factory OC configuration. Okay, so let's move on to the benchmark graphs. As usual, we'll be testing with our AMD Ryzen 9 3950X GPU test rig with 32GB of DDR4, 3200CL14 memory. The latest drivers available at the time of testing have been used, so let's get into the results. For these custom AIB reviews, I don't bother with many game tests. We already have all that data from our day one coverage. So we're just going to have a quick look at out of the box performance along with the manual overclock in Shadow of the Tomb Raider. At 1440p, we're looking at a mere 3% performance improvement for the Nitro Plus over the AMD reference card, while I was able to squeeze a further 3% from it with a manual overclock. The gains at 4K are a little more impressive. Here the Nitro Plus was 5% faster than the AMD reference model out of the box, and then 10% faster with my overclock. That's not really an amazing performance improvement, but it was enough to match the stock RTX 3080. When it comes to power consumption, the Sapphire Nitro Plus is certainly tuned more aggressively than the AMD reference model, as power consumption has increased by 13%. My manual overclock increased power usage by a further 8%, and now we're above what the RTX 3090 Founders Edition sucks down. The stock operating temperatures of the Sapphire Nitro Plus are very impressive, especially given that AMD did set a rather high bar. Here we're looking at a 2 degree reduction for the GPU and GDR6 memory, so not an amazing improvement, but again given how good the reference model was, any improvement is quite impressive. Then when it comes to VRM temps we are looking at a 6 degree reduction which is quite significant, though again both models do maintain a very cool VRM temperature that's well within spec. Finally, here's a quick look at noise normalized operating temperatures, though please note we're not power normalizing the cards as I feel that's potentially one step too far, making it more of a scientific test and less practical consumer advice. The big advantage of the Nitro Plus is its increased power target going beyond what can be achieved with the reference models, so it's unlikely you'll be dialing it back for even lower thermals, but it's possible you will want to tweak the fan curve. So when noise normalized, there is virtually no temperature difference between these two models, which is an impressive result for the Nitro Plus, given it's handling 13% more power. It is clearly the superior design, though not by much. The Sapphire RX 6800 XT Nitro Plus is really everything I've come to expect from a Nitro Plus graphics card. It's cool, it's quiet, and it offers a good amount of OC headroom, at least when compared to the AMD reference model. Speaking of the reference model, despite AMD for the first time ever setting the bar very high, this wasn't a problem for Sapphire as they managed to match the thermals while offering superior out of the box performance. This achievement is made all the more impressive when you realize that they've accomplished this with a design that's much lighter and therefore a bit easier on your PCIe slot. Actually the main advantage to shaving off the extra weight 
is the reduced PCB flex, something we've seen quite a lot of recently with the monstrous RTX 3080 and 3090 graphics cards. Excessive weight also makes it more challenging to mount the cooler to the GPU die, something ASUS has had trouble with in the past, most notably with their Strix 5700 XT. So in terms of performance, the Nitro Plus is excellent. Whether or not it's the best 6800 XT is yet to be seen, but it is certainly good enough to recommend. At this point in time though, it is the first and only custom AIB 6800 XT graphics card that we've reviewed, but on hand for testing, I do have the Power Color Red Devil, so we'll look at that shortly. I also have the Red Dragon on the way, along with some models from XFX, and of course there will be more as well. So many more 6800 series reviews to come. Now, key reasons to purchase the Nitro Plus over the reference model include the dual BIOS support and increased overclocking headroom. Other reasons might include stuff like the physical design, perhaps you like the look of the Nitro Plus better, or maybe it's the RGB effects that you like more. Personally, I do prefer the construction of the reference card, being that it's all aluminium. And while that certainly is a nice luxury, I feel for most of you, the dual BIOS support and improved overclocking will be enough to sway you towards the Nitro Plus. There is, of course, one last rather important detail, the price. And unlike the AMD reference model, which targets the MSRP, the Nitro Plus will certainly be fetching a premium. Unfortunately, at this point in time, Sapphire hasn't been able to tell me what that premium is. I've asked multiple times and they weren't able to tell me in time for shooting this review. So if I do have that information, I will pin it as a comment below. But given what we saw with the 5700 XT version, that came in $60 US over the MSRP. So I'd estimate that the 6800 XT Nitro Plus will cost you at least $700 US, if not a little bit over $700 US. So that's RTX 3080 money, but of course you can't buy one of those right now and probably won't be able to for at least the next few months. Hopefully we're not gonna see the same thing with the 6800 XT. I am crossing my fingers for good availability in three to four weeks time, but I'm certainly not gonna hold my breath, but I am happy to cross my fingers. I guess right now talking about the price doesn't really matter, which is a bit of an unfortunate situation given that the price really should be everything. Anyway, that is going to do it for this one. If you liked this video, you know what to do. You can also subscribe for more content. As I said, we have a lot more 6800 XT and 6800 AIB card reviews coming. There's also some new NVIDIA GeForce reviews coming on the channel shortly. So if you're interested in that, also make sure you're subscribed. You can also join us over on Floatplane or Patreon if you'd like to become a Harbour Unbox community member. It will get you access to our exclusive Discord chat where you can talk with Tim and myself and the rest of the awesome Harbour Unbox community. We also do a live stream at least once a month. Again, Tim and myself do that and we answer your questions directly live and chat about current events. Uh, also, behind the scenes videos, they're worth checking out if you're interested. Uh, Q&As, oh, so anyway, if you're interested, a link for all that stuff is in the video description. If not, perfectly fine, and I would like to just thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time. <laughs>